Hello everyone, welcome to the 50th podcast from Research to Reality. It's my great honor and pleasure to have Utz Uwe Haus. Hello, Utz. Hi, Dikran. Welcome. Thanks for having me. So, Utz, you came here to this beautiful place, very emotional to all people from HP. Uh, it's a garage, uh, Bill and Dave's garage. But you came all the way from Switzerland. And then even before that, you were in Germany. So tell us, wh wh what was your beginning of technology path? Well, I shouldn't go back all the way in the beginning, but I, I studied in Berlin at TU uh, math uh, with a bit of computer science as a minor, um, mostly focusing on programming languages and, and compiler design, but really going for math. And I did uh, a diploma in that on differential geometry and then optimization. Um, that got me into a PhD position in Magdeburg, of all places, uh, mm. where we could have almost crossed paths, as we almost. found out later, because mm. you were passing through there in the same I years did. in the 90s. Um, and then uh, after the PhD, I stayed there and had a junior research group on applying math and computation and computer science aspects, really programming interesting new algorithms for disciplines that were not using optimization properly uh, through different disciplines like material science, biology, systems biology was coming up. I had a research group in that, and that brought me to ETH eventually. Mm -hmm. So that's how I ended up in Switzerland. I can tell you that your math knowledge really comes across very uh, effectively whenever we talk. But you mentioned you came to ETH. Yeah. But, uh, but now you are at HP, part that you were at Cray. Yeah. And how, what, what's that? When I'm missing those people. Right, so, so I, I came to ETH uh, because if you have an option to go to ETH, you don't refuse that. Mm -hmm. Uh, my wife also liked to go to Switzerland for, for business reasons, just uh, finishing her education as a doctor. And um, so I stayed there for around five years as an uh, assistant, a senior assistant. Um, but then I uh, had a project with uh, Adrian Tate, uh, who was running um, in the CTO office of Cray. Mm -hmm. And uh, after a few months of uh, joint work on polyhedral compilation aspects, uh, I was frustrated with the academic uh, career path and another almost a uh, professorship somewhere. And, and so uh, I told him, look, if you ever have a position for me, um, let me know. And Cray offered me a position. I started with Adrian to build um, a team out of Switzerland. Very nice, very nice. And then the rest is history. What? HP acquired Cray, and then I have a pleasure to work with you directly. Yeah, so his, his young history, right? We yeah. will make more history looking back at the garage. There's yeah. another 70 years to go. So I miss you in Magdeburg, but not here. <laughs> Uh, but, but there's another really important reason why we're here. You were promoted recently. Congratulations. Thank you. Can you tell us what were you promoted for and a few details about it? So uh, I was promoted to a uh, distinguished uh, technologist, which is uh, one of the really interesting points in the career path in, in the TCP path of uh, HPE. Um, and where I tell all the people in my team, essentially, they should aspire to be master or better because it's a research team. We do interesting stuff across the business. Uh, and that's really where, where my promotion comes from. So we've been influential, not just me, but the team, but me leading it uh, in uh, numerous very big uh, customer wins in Europe. So that's clearly one of the big aspects of all mm -hmm. of this, uh, starting with Lumi, um, the European pre-exascale system, but also other ones like Kaust recently um, and similar ones. So there's the business aspect. There is the, the continuous pre-sales integration where we've been um, called upon to understand customer problems that normal pre-sales folks don't have an answer to. Uh, customers like that if they get more insight beyond what's in the catalog, what's in the um, general briefings. And that customer intim intimacy also telling the customer intimacy, telling our um, partners we've understood their problems before they wrote the RFP. Mm -hmm. um, that's where uh, our team shines. And then there's pure research parts. So we had a number of interesting projects where I wrote the proposal with others, some more or less alone, um, where we had uh, influence on European technology um, involvement. And the fourth one really is the political aspect. Uh, it's an interesting time for a global company like previously Cray, now HPE, um, to be recognized for their investments, even if they're maybe not as big as some European players want them to be in Europe and um, get a share of that. So that requires political involvement, policy making, research agenda, writing, and um, I've spent quite a bit of time on that in recent years. I nice. think that's been awarded, uh, rewarded with that promotion. Nice. 
So Norm Jupi, senior fellow, who used to be my manager, uh, used to say that DT is one of the best positions. You know, even though there are a couple of higher positions, you still have to meddle in technology, and uh, you, you can enjoy. You know, and I, I won't go into other details. <laughs> but because DT is on the technical path, can you tell me not about political aspects, but about these technical aspects that you were promoted for for these first three contributions? Right, so, so one was really um, algorithmic aspects in modeling energy systems. So there was a project called Plan for Rest where we really worked on the solving aspects. How can you solve um, certain mathematical optimization problems on the gear that we like to sell? Uh, so the very big uh, Cray systems. Uh, we had to start small because people were coming from laptops. and mm -hmm. There's a big gap in between. So that um, uh, was one of the aspects that we worked on. Then there's uh, a middleware we designed um, called Maestro, which is on the infrastructure side of uh, where our software stack is currently falling short. It allows you to model the data movement or how to avoid data movement um, independent of a programming abstraction. And that's really valued by uh, a recent award we got for Destination Earth, where this is uh, because we co-designed it with ECMWF, former Cray customer, and hopefully soon again customer if we do the right things. Um, the European Center for Medium-Term Weather Forecast. They told us what their requirements would be in the next and the next next generation of uh, large-scale weather and climate simulations because data movement is where their codes are falling short, not computations. Mm -hmm. And that's where we sit. We, we built that infrastructure. Um, I was very much involved in the design of that and the coding of that uh, using LibFabric when the company hadn't decided to make that the central part of mm -hmm. uh, our Slingshot Interconnect infrastructure, but ready for it when everybody else joined the LibFabric wagon, we said, oh yeah, we know how to do that. And so that's where we're still working with the Slingshot team, the software team around that um, to make sure our software runs best on our systems, but is portable to others. Very nice. So what do you do? How do you, because you generate IP. Mm -hmm. And it goes through products, but do you and your team also write papers, patents, standards? How do you express yourself outside of products or in so, addition to So products? actually, the products part is maybe the weakest part that we, we mm -hmm. need to talk about, how to m make more product uh, um, outcomes out of our um, first development. So we consider ourselves to be producing ideas and proof of concept pieces that, number one, we out really open source uh, to the community uh, where required by the funding agencies. We do in internal uh, advertisement for that. We try to find groups that can make use of it. Um, and we reuse them in the next POC. So we don't have a patent yet. That's on my list. I have a reasonable publication list from the Academic Times. I don't have a patent. I always wanted one. So that's still in the, in the we'll, works. We'll do it together. <laughs> we'll do that together. Um, in Cray, patenting uh, out of Europe was just not a topic, so that's why we didn't do it back then. Um, innovation disclosure is something we're learning how to do. Um, I think it's quite easy uh, in some sense, uh, and you get awarded, so it's worth doing. Uh, but we write papers, uh, we go to conferences, um, present our work, internal and external, um, and that's, that's where, we, where we show the results. Of course, some of the projects have actual deliverables, and they go to public or uh, consortium-wide dissemination. So <clears throat> some of that doesn't have to be steered that much. Mm -hmm. so, so it's really automatic. You mentioned LibFabric. Yep. It's not quite a standard. Could be considered almost de facto standard. Do you care about standards in so your work? So, so standards is what keeps uh, a business like ours, like the compute, or in particular the high-performance computing uh, environment, uh, alive. Um, we need interoperability and only standards can make that possible. However, in some cases you need to be ahead of the standard and present something like LibFabric, which is by all means not just a de facto standard, it's an upcoming standard. Uh, and you see that by vendor adoption, right? Uh, Intel is using it, uh, we're using it. Uh, others are jumping on that reluctantly, so AWS is pushing it. So there, it, it's becoming a standard by adoption. Um, but there's also standards that just need to be agreed upon, and MPI is an example like that, where people took all the learnings of different uh, parallel distributed programming mm -hmm. paradigms and wrote a better one. Um, and so standards are important. We're not, oh, we do, actually we do have someone on the MPI uh, standardization body at this time in our team. Um, it's something we do. 
and for uh, acronym aficionados, POC is proof of concept. Proof of concept, sorry. AWS is Amazon Web Services, yeah. MPI is message passing. passing. Yeah. Thanks for filling that in. Uh, you end up in that niche of knowing your acronyms, and uh, this audience may not know all of them. So it may be obvious for a lot of people, but let's just put it obviously for others. Um, how are we helping humanity? How are we helping Mother Earth? Your work on sustainability seems to fall right there, and you are also a digital twin of, uh, of the Earth that you've been working on right. seems to be. C can you tell us a little bit more how you perceive that? Right, I mean, our technology guided society these days um, has lots of opportunities for us to make a difference by utilizing technology for good and not for bad. It's always difficult for scientists to make that judgment when they invent a new technology because technology is agnostic of its uh, um, outcomes per se, but we can make the difference. And so if we use our high performance computing engines or our AI engines that um, fulfill certain roles, uh, we can choose what to use them for. Uh, we can also choose how to efficiently use them. And so that brings us to the sustainability aspect. Um, and there, there has been a, a debate in Europe in particular on how much energy do you want to spend mm -hmm. on computations to save the Earth from overheating while you're cooling your devices, right? Is it worth spending a gigawatt on a compute that in the end will only save a few watts? And doing the right thing, choosing the right problems to work on, that's where we can make a difference. Telling people about what is possible, how to efficiently use big compute rather than many small computes, or vice versa. Uh, how to put compute in the edge. If we could save a watt in every telephone charger, that would save more than we can save on any of our big installations in a week. Mm -hmm. okay. We always talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you're very interesting. You have very interesting perspective because you see how things are in Europe, in at least two countries, and then in US. Can you compare the situation? How is it observed? So I'd like to make the point first that, so my team, the EMEA Research Lab, is really distributed across Europe. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, diverse in its nationality and cultural, scientific, personal backgrounds. And gender too. Uh, gender too. I, I, I don't, I mean, for, for us, we hire talent. We hire yeah. people that can do a certain job well when they get hired and have perspectives to do other things later on. We don't hire for projects, we hire for people. and so. I consider it, I mean, maybe for Americans that's harder to understand, but I consider it a great win to have a French and a German in my team to work together and not against each other, because in European history, that's interesting. We have someone from the Balkan, from Bosnia actually, on the team. We learn about their background, about their recent history, about how Europe has not been free of wars in 80 years, even before the Ukrainian crisis that we have now. Um, and we have this distribution of uh, France, Germany, um, Switzerland with Italy and Bosnia and Britain, New Zealand, all in one team. So we learn about the backgrounds of people in the team. Uh, we take that as a, not challenge even, just as an opportunity to do our team meetings in the different places, learn about culture that's close to each other and still historically far apart. Does this... Um equity and inclusion stop when it starts about soccer or, or not? Well, I'm a big ignorant on any sports that involves round objects that include soccer. So uh, I, I think actually we have people who do sports uh, of different sorts. We don't really make fun of them for any reason. Uh, and some of them have a strong opinion on, on which team should win which game. And uh, I think that's the least important part. So sports really uh, is just one of the many aspects of uh, of things people like or don't like in the team. And you need to understand how to not bother people in a team meeting with a soccer game if they don't want to go there. Uh, that's part of being uh, equitable to everyone. And inclusive. Very and nice. And inclusive. Very nice. Can you tell me, have you observed any other differences culturally or, or otherwise, food, anything across the geographies? Well, food is, is diverse and we enjoy getting the different aspects mm -hmm. of that. Also, uh, the, the diets people have are different, and it's not just about where they come from, but also what they enjoy. Um, 
we can go into that maybe later when, when we talk about hobbies. We should stay uh, true to the question at the moment. But really, um, that's part of it. I spent quite a bit of time in the U.S. I uh, was in a U.S. high school in, in mm -hmm. the Midwest, in Kansas, of all places. So for me, the U.S. is a second home. Um, I, I observe differences. I observe more differences over time rather than over location. So 30 years back in Kansas was very different from what mm -hmm. I see in the U.S. nowadays. Yeah. Um, but let's, let's keep politics out of the technical talk today. Okay. And then you've been working a lot. I mean, we are almost working around the clock. When you wake up, I go to sleep, well, and vice versa. You wake up very early. But tell, me, but tell me, what do you do outside of the work? Too much. Uh, if I have spare time, I, I have uh, a very old uh, wooden Borean sailing boat, which is mm -hmm. as old as I am, uh, that takes a lot of work to, to get back into running shape for every season. Uh, in a small lake nearby, so reasonably competitive uh, with the neighbors, but not uh, on a big scale. I like do-it-yourself stuff, so looking at this garage gets me started immediately to look for a soldering iron. And I, I don't have one of these uh, drilling machines, I'm, I'd like to have one, but I have all kinds of woodworking equipment, so that's part of it. Cooking, baking, making sure my kids learn where food comes from, uh, how it's made, uh, from sausages to fulfill a German stereotype in beer. Uh, you have to make that yourself to know what you're having in another time when you don't make it yourself. Um, but also reading the French cooking guides of the 19th century. So very much uh, different interests. Beautiful. You, you know you're the second sailor on the podcast out of 50 podcasts. So did you have Nick here? Nick Dubé yeah, was, I know. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to send me some pictures of uh, your I sailboat. Will, I will. What else do you do? Are you reading any books? I don't have much time for reading these days, uh, so um, occasionally I, I pick up an old one that I have, and I have many unread ones. The unread stack, I think, lasts for another hundred years. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, there. Uh, recently, I looked back into talking about the U.S. and its changes. Uh, Travels with Charlie, uh, Steinbeck novel from mm -hmm. the 50s, uh, one of my favorites from from high school times. Um, that's an interesting look on the U.S. as it was and comparing it to today. Um, but, I mean, there's, there's good literature every year. Patti Smith's uh, recent uh, poems three years ago, that was a good one. Mm -hmm. Do you still read in German? I do, I do. I do read German. I do read uh, Latin occasionally. I just nice. went to an archive with my daughter to look at uh, 15th century manuscripts, which in Switzerland you can actually get in the archive into your hand, mm -hmm. in parchment, uh, in, in real, um, which is something in Germany we're missing out of our historic loss it's a lost society right mm -hmm. we, we lost all the archives all the buildings every decade or five decades on average while well, switzerland has preserved a lot so that's a major difference for for a german switzerland is kind of this island of europe as it has been destroyed around uh, in the centuries so both independence and staying away from the wars pays off long term in a big and way and there's a debate to be had about the wars i mean switzerland just exported yeah. uh, the soldiers to other countries and had treaties how they cannot attack each other and since they were at the fronts of each of the european uh warfaring nations they couldn't attack each other while mm -hmm. they were crossing into switzerland <coughs> so there's politics more than mm -hmm. more than luck since we're approaching the end of this podcast do you have any message for our younger colleagues how can they follow your path to the same or different destination you shouldn't follow others' paths. You should pick your own path. Do mm -hmm. what you're good at. Do what you like and find a niche. Don't stay in the niche, but open it for others. Prepare what you can do. Show it. Don't be shy. If you have a good result, tell it to others and find collaborators because you can't do anything alone. You, you can do a lot alone, but even Bill and Dave were two. Right? So, so you need to find your collaborators, find the right people who can help you and you can, who can give you the right input that you're lacking in your own inspirations. Very so. nice. Very nice. Thank you very much. For Thank coming you, Dayan. Thank you for having me.